Um, hello everyone and welcome to our X space this evening, morning, afternoon, night, wherever you are. We are barely a week away from the fifth and final scheduled round of negotiations for an international agreement on plastic pollution. Um, this is going to be held in Busan, South Korea, and it's the first INC among the five uh, that is going to be in Asia. So it's of specific relevance to us in, in the Asia region. Um, the internationally legally binding instrument is the first of its kind opportunity to address plastic pollution. Um, in that, it, it can create a level playing field through globally agreed standards and globally mandated targets, leading to a path for comprehensive national policies that can regulate plastic production and consumption. And of course, uh, it therefore would be the potentially the most significant multilateral environmental agreement in, in recent times. Um, as we approach INC5, we must remember that it's a critical juncture for us to get binding language to reduce production, plastic polymer production, phase out chemicals, including polymers, have a strong provision on just transition, and a very robust financial mechanisms for, for treaty implementation and compliance that um, prioritizes global South countries, specifically small island developing states and economies in transition. Um, hello, everyone. I'm your moderator for today, and we have an incredible lineup of speakers who will shed light on different aspects of the treaty. Uh, and I am Gaia's uh, plastic policy officer in Asia Pacific, in that I, I lead the uh, plastic treaty work in the Asia Pacific region with our wonderful members, some of whom are present here today. So let's get started. Let me, uh, it, it is my very, very kind pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. First, we have Michelle Rice. Michelle uh, is actually Dr. Rice, is a uh, um, currently serving as Sustainability Officer at Healthcare Without Harm, Southeast Asia, uh, our member uh, of Gaia Asia Pacific. Dr. Rice also very recently uh, co-authored an opinion piece in the diplomat called the double-edged sword of plastics in Asia's healthcare. And, and I'm very grateful that he would today be throwing light on the health aspects of plastic pollution and demands for plastic treaty. We are also grateful to be joined by Johnson Do, who is a member of the Executive Council of the International Alliance of Waste Pickers, one of our very important actors and, and stakeholders. Uh, he is the leader of the Ghana Green Waste Pickers Cooperative um, and one of the founding members of Kepon uh, Landfill Waste Pickers Association. Next, we also have um, my very dear colleague, Andrea Lima, found, founder of Foundation Plastico Project from Ecuador and Gaia's Waste Picker Coordinator uh, for the Plastics Treaty. Finally, we are also grateful to be joined by Nirej Sedrex. I am not sure if I'm saying your name right, so please excuse me. Um, Nirej is from End Plastic Pollution in Uganda. Uh, End Plastic Pollution is also one of our members from Africa who've been working to address plastic pollution in uh, many other countries in Africa. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our listeners. Just a reminder, as we will have a QA and a session depending on time, so I encourage you all to ask your question, to share your thoughts, uh, your expertise in the X thread, and remember to keep your questions and comments concise so we can address as many as possible uh, today. So um, I'm still waiting for uh, all of our speakers to be uh, promoted uh, as speakers. So let me go to Andrea, who I can see uh, in the list here. Andrea, just speaking to you um, on just transition and based on your experience working with frontline communities and, and especially with speakers around the world um, and indigenous peoples as well, why, according to you, is it uh, imperative to have just transition in the treaty text uh, and not just a uh, uh, dedicated provision, but across the text. Over to you, Andrea. Hi, thank you, Artika. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am Andrea 
Andrea. This is the first time using the echo space. So I apologize in advance if I have any inconvenience, uh, technically speaking. Um, about your question, um, well, just transition is uh, very important for frontline communities, for waste seekers, for indigenous people, as this is the, the subject or the, the, the issue that could ensure that those that have been most Andrea, I'm sorry. Could you could you come closer to your mouthpiece? We are not able to hear you clearly on this side. Okay. Um, can you hear me better there? Yes, much better. Go ahead. Okay. So I was saying that just transition is important uh, because these provisions will help us to ensure that those that have been most affected by plastic pollution does not have to suffer the same injustices again. So we need a treaty uh, with a, a strong just transition framework that goes in line with human workers and indigenous people's rights. Um, for we speakers um, that have been, they, they have had an historical contribution to mitigate plastic pollution. So we need a just transition that recognize the work that they have been doing for decades um, and, and, and help them transition to other possible systems of work that has a dignified and that is dignified and paid because right now uh, they are working in very precarious conditions and even though they don't, do not uh, transfer to other uh, types of work they need to ensure their their payment and their conditions as workers in the in the waste management stream um, for indigenous peoples and frontline communities um, that, that, that have sacrificed their, their territories uh, due to extraction of fossil fuels to, to them become plastics, they need a uh, just transition that ensures reparation and guarantees no repetition for the injustices uh, and threats that they had to face and that they are facing right now. Uh, so only in this way we can move forward to a plastic-free future. Amazing. Thanks for that very quick intervention. Andrea, I'll, I'll come back to you. In the meantime, I, I want to go to Dr. Michelle, um, who has many years of experience working on plastics, uh, waste and chemicals. Uh, Dr. Michelle, how would you explain the ways in which plastic pollution crisis poses a global health crisis? Um, overall, at the global level, so we know that uh, plastics production is increasing, right? And uh, expected to triple by 2050. And in, in line with that, the healthcare sector consumes a lot of um, plastics, so around 50 million, 15 million tons per year. In addition to that, um, during the plastics audit or waste audit conducted by Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia in some healthcare facilities in Indonesia and the Philippines. So um, approximately around 40 to 70 percent of the waste generated in hospitals are plastics. And a lot of it comes from um, the medical and non-medical, such as um, single use, plastics, um, plates, and utensils, and it out outweighs the medical devices, actually. And uh, these plastics, whether it's non-medical or medical, they contain toxic chemical additives. And uh, recently, in the WHO consultation, uh, in terms of the greenhouse gas emission of the health sector, which is a lot already, um, supply chains, meaning um, the supplies, the medical devices, the PPEs contribute to actually 70% of the greenhouse gases emitted by the health sector. So aside from the greenhouse gas emission, um, the uh, plastics that are being consumed in the health sector also contributes to the microplastics. So these um, issues that we have uh, contributes uh, to the plastic pollution and it poses a serious threat to human health 
at each stage from the production to even the disposal or the waste management level. Because aside from the plastic product itself, plastics often contain um, thousands of toxic additives and chemicals that are carcinogens or chemicals that causes cancer, neurotoxicant, which uh, is very dangerous to our brain, and endocrine disruptors, which causes a lot of diseases uh, because it leaches um, from the waste persisting to the environment, so um, endangering our patient and communities. So vulnerable groups such as um, babies, newborns, young children, and even um, old age are exposed to these harmful chemicals from plastics. Hence, um, we are seeing this, actually it was highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic, but even after two years, the COVID-19 pandemic, we're still seeing this problem and um, developing countries such as the Philippines um, were not uh, still not being able to handle and manage the waste that was generated from the COVID pandemic. Hence, why we see the plastic pollution crisis a global health crisis. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Michelle. I think this was a very quick intervention to throw light on just the uh, enormity of the um, plastic crisis in the healthcare sector and just to give a number to it, there are known uh, to be 16,000 odd chemicals uh, found in plastics and we have that data for about 6,000 of those of which 1% according to a plastic governance report uh, on plastic uh, chemicals found in plastics from last year, about 128 of these thousands of chemicals are actually um, regulated in any way across the, the different chemical conventions. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Moving on. Um, and we'll come back to Dr. Michelle. Feel free to post your questions. Um, I would like to now bring in uh, Johnson Doe. Uh, Johnson, in your work as a waste picker and actress, keep on dumping site for so many years and helping lead the transition of waste pickers into doorstep waste collection uh, in the nearby coastal community. What do you think the plastic treaty could could help in uh, enabling a just transition for waste pickers? Okay, thank you. As uh, we all know, um, what's the plastic treaty about? It's about, uh, we believe this is an instrument, a legal instrument, which is going to help tackle plastic pollution. And also, uh, we working in Ghana at the Kwenkosa community is, is a way of transitioning ourselves from the landfill to the community. Uh, to make sure uh, we help tackle plastic pollution and other areas where uh, waste is not supposed to be. So uh, in our view, one of the things that waste pickers always demand or look for is that the global plastic treaty should um, elevate a just transition from a secondary consideration to a, a core guiding framework for the circular transition by integrating the the, the the uh, holistic ethical solutions to benefit people and the planet. And what this means is that the uh, just transition should be a process that aims to share the benefit of a green economy and while supporting those who may lose out. For example, waste pickers, uh, just transition could include and help them have equitable or economic opportunities, um, social protections, uh, living income, access to good living income, recognition. Uh, I say recognition because be recognized, we speakers are supposed to be recognized in laws, policies, and forums uh, at all national levels. And also, we, we believe participation also counts uh, in public governance and forums, uh, health and safety, and also protection. And uh, to add to that, waste pickers are important contributors to the circular economy as, uh, and solid waste management, as we all know. But they are often uh, yet not adequately acknowledged. So a lack of comprehensive data on waste pickers can lead to governance 
um, responses that are not inclusive. So we believe uh, the role that waste pickers play and uh, to, to, to improve from waste collection mm -hmm. uh, is bad. Sorry, Johnson, could Sorry, you repeat yes. your last point on, on the role of waste pickers? Yeah, so the, the important role waste pickers play, they are they are they are they play a important they are they are a big contributor to the circular economy and solid waste management as a whole. But they are often not yet adequately uh, acknowledged. So we say that um, lack of comprehensive data on waste pickers can lead to uh, government responses that are non-inclusive and also we improve health and safety and sanitation after removing waste from urban areas where municipal waste collection is, is very bad or is not happening. So looking at the plastic treaty and looking at the, 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 the just transition models where we have already working in this system for decades by providing a model of sustainability for ourselves for so many years, we believe to be the, the, the forefront or the, the, the key players in, in, in this role and what the, the treaty should make sure we were not left uh, behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnson. Uh, I want to follow up, but I will circle back to you. Um, and I want to now in, invite uh, Nirel. Uh, speaking on real solutions, Nirede, in your work with communities and material recovery facility in Uganda, how can just transition, uh, I'm sorry, how can zero waste strategies help fight plastic pollution and promote uh, just transition? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share with you uh, today. Uh, particularly, you've asked about uh, zero waste. Yeah. Um, first of all, number one, uh, like uh, Johnson uh, has highlighted, that he, for us to have this treaty strong and that impactful, it should be, you know, addressing the impact at the front line communities, the communities that are facing uh, increasing plastic pollution, but they are really that incapable of managing this problem. So if we, and, and that uh, looks into the just transition and the, the issues of having waste pickers on the board. And that is the stem of, of zero waste. Zero waste is communities at play. Zero waste is waste pickers plus these communities, plus people, members of these communities coming, uh, coming together to make sure that they make decisions, uh, they take actions, and they are responsible for how their waste is managed. That is literal about zero waste. However, we go further to address issues of waste segregation, issues of after waste segregation, waste processing, or, 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 or how or repurposing of waste, compositing of waste, to see that maybe we can feed into the organic lifestyle and all these uh, these actions. So zero waste is is, is 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 a solution which we should see the global plastic treaty um, harnessing because it is a solution that is bringing communities together, waste pickers like we have highlighted. It is bringing government together to join this fight, and it is one inclusive solution that uh, cannot be disputed by any other uh, any other uh, any other solution it it is the solution that brings that brings the eyes to the ground that brings the hands to the real problem uh, i like the way uh, mr desmond from gayo says it that the right solutions are, are with the people that are on the right problem that are with the problem that is where you can craft the right solution. So we need to empower this uh, zero waste approach. But also, um, not to not to forget is that uh, we need to see that there is 
is, is, is that, that this policy, the, 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 the Global Plastic Treaty, comes and pushes for policies that will empower a push, that will empower support, a support environment for having zero waste implemented, not only just to endorse it. We don't need just a paper. We don't need just a fancy policy, a fancy treaty that is not going to be put into play. So we need something that is really concrete, something that is really strong, something that will address uh, the problems that we are facing today in regards to poor waste management in our communities. So if it is to push for zero waste, then we need really tangible actions to have zero waste uh, possible in our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nihere. I mean, you have really beautifully spoken and also enlightened me with your comments on how zero waste is really the only solution that brings uh, all of the actors, all of the communities together. Um, and a treaty must ensure that there is tangible action, there is tangible support um, for zero waste, for reuse, for refill, and, and that's something that we'll keep, we will keep pushing for, um, as well as, like Johnson said, just transition, which acknowledges uh, waste pickers' efforts, which um, supports waste pickers um, in the work that they are doing for so many decades and, and takes their knowledge in implementation of the treaty forward. So, um, with this beautiful note, I, I will go back um, to Andrea with a follow-up question, if I could. Um, Andrea, could you explain to our listeners how plastic reduction contributes to a just transition? And, of course, this is a long-term uh, just transition that we are thinking of. Yes, thank you, Arpita. Very interesting to hear the rest of colleagues in this conversation. Um, regarding plastic production uh, and just transition, so, well, plastics, um, they have a negative impact along its life cycle. So we have in the upstream, for example, indigenous lands that have suffered the impacts of extraction of fossil fuels, um, and then that then become plastics. Um, so they are facing health and environmental issues that threaten the, the way that, that they have related to nature for centuries, right? Um, so we have that in the, in, in the upstream part of the life cycle. In the downstream, we have waste pickers, for example, that work on precarious conditions without social security and no formal recognitions as workers in the waste management sector. So um, these are negative impacts that some of the groups that we are working with uh, in regards of just transition are facing at the moment and that they have faced uh, for, for, many, uh, for a long time. Um, so we will not be able to solve this issue if the plastic tab is still open. If we keep producing plastics the way we are doing now, um, these impacts will will only become worse uh, for for vulnerable groups in the future. So we need um, a plastics treaty that address plastic production reduction uh, and that it it makes it part of the equation so that so we can have a positive result. Um, we need. Uh, negotiators to really understand that if we keep producing in the way we are doing now, we cannot have a just transition at all. Uh, we must stop producing uh, uh, plastics so these uh, impacted communities and the injustices that they have to suffer around plastic pollution uh, cannot, cannot, longer, uh, cannot no longer take place. Uh, and that we can transit to other systems that can guarantee a strong safeguards for human health, uh, dignify work for workers, um, and obviously uh, the protection of the environment as well. Thank you so much, Andrea. And 
of course, there are so many projections and, and these projections continue to come in. We, we have a paper as recent as yesterday talking about why plastic production is so important. But as you said, um, the even the cost of plastic pollution uh, vis-a-vis the especially the production is as high as 13.7 trillion since 1950 and this is in US dollar and if we continue to to follow the trajectory that we are currently on for production we will have uh, famously said uh, more plastics in the ocean than you know fish um, by 2050 and of course even if we stop plastic production right now, we still have enough uh, plastics left over in our environment for, for many decades that we will need to address. So these are just very well-known facts that have come from independent scientists. Um, and unfortunately, we are still debating these facts in the negotiations because there is there remains uh, the conflict of interest from petrochemical uh, member states and, of course, their industry friends. Uh, anyway, so that's just something we, we keep calling out, and, and that just brings me back to the health argument, um, especially since there are very limited information on the health cost um, of plastic pollution. There is very limited data currently available especially when it comes to uh, health costs. What we know, do know is that in Global South, the health costs uh, of plastic pollution could be 10 times the cost in, in Global North. So with, with that uh, in mind, uh, I want to go back to uh, Dr. Michel to answer the question of, of why medical products uh, must not be excluded from the purview of Global Plastics Treaty via exemptions. That, and that is something that uh, a lot of the countries are asking for uh, in, in, in the controls of um, plastics use, especially single-use plastics. And in, in this explanation, if you could also uh, elaborate on how a toxic-free healthcare sector with lower plastics use is, is possible. Uh, thank you for that um, question, uh, Arpita. So currently, um, what we are right now, so communities, um, health workers, and even health systems are already facing the alarming impacts of plastics. Right, and the worst impacts of plastics are not actually equally distributed, but um, as you, as some of the speakers here have mentioned, it they are concentrated in the most vulnerable. So whether it's the way speakers, whether it's our patients, and even the children, um, I just actually want to highlight. Um, because recently we just had a conference in Vietnam, and uh, UNICEF has mentioned that children are uh, at most risk in toxic chemicals such as lead and mercury. And actually, for example, when we incinerate plastics or even just simply the disposal of plastics, we are already um, increasing the risk for exposure for children and even communities living near these areas. So um, under resource communities who have no basic access to health um, services are actually vulnerable to these um, health impacts. Hence, in addition to that, um, what the argument currently right now, for example, in the health sector is that single use um, is increasing in the name of infection prevention. But I just wanna highlight that there is an article in the Journal of American Medical Association in that the authors concluded that for certain medical devices, uh, single use, um, disposable products may be what we have right now, but broad scale, unfettered, and irrational adoption of disposable items in the name of infection prevention is harmful, unsustainable, and unacceptable. So, despite the um, advertising the importance of plastics in healthcare, so the risk in terms of exposure to the uh, medical devices are part of the problem because of what we mentioned previously, the exposure to toxic chemicals and uh, the microplastics to our patients. Hence, 
why we should not accept the health sector because while the health sector is vulnerable to the plastic pollution, we are also contributing to the plastic pollution. And if we exempt the health sector, which is 10% of the global economy, and the health sector also contributes to the problem in which if the health sector is a country, we are the fifth um, fifth most, um, the, we are the fifth in terms of the greenhouse gas emitters. Hence, uh, we should be part of the solution in the Global Plastic Treaty. And um, there are many case studies that this is actually already starting. Some healthcare facilities in Southeast Asia are already innovating. So if we exempt the health sector in the Global Plastic Treaty, we are stifling any progress. We will not be able to research for alternative and um, it would stall the movement away from single-use plastics and toxic plastics hinder innovation and impede the adoption of safe, safer alternative and even reuse um, systems. Hence why we are working with the health system, the healthcare facilities that are already seeing the impacts of plastic pollution and are supporting our costs in healthcare without harm. So if you will check out our website, Healthcare Without Harm, you will see many case studies that are already published by healthcare facilities uh, on how they are moving away from single-use plastics. Some healthcare facilities are already implementing sustainable procurement in which even without national policies, they are already um, successful in terms of their health systems. Um, and at the same time, if you will also check our website, we, all, we also have an open letter in which it is supported by over 18 million healthcare professionals, individuals, and healthcare facilities on why we should not exempt the health sector in the Global Plastics Treaty. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this intervention. And, and we've seen the, the, the open letter as well as the uh, you know, different events and mobilization that you all have been doing um, for inclusion of health in the plastic treaty and addressing health to not just from the point of view of public health, but health as a measure for human rights and justice. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Michelle, it's also the waste pickers who, who are at, at the highest uh, exposure because they deal with most of the plastic waste. They, they uh, also uh, the backbone of the um, plastics diverse logistics economy. And in that, they are one of the most important um, stakeholders, actors who, whose voices, whose perspective need to be considered. Um, and with that, I, I do want to go back to, um, to Johnson on why do you think the knowledge and voices of face pickers should be at the forefront of treaty discussions? Okay, thank you very much. So um, this clearly or this uh, equally poses the question of uh, who are waste pickers and what do they really do? And if you are able to get a meaning of this question, you clearly tells you that uh, we the it will clearly tell you the areas that we operate and where our work is and what we really do. And uh, around as uh, as as it is now, around 20 million waste pickers are across the globe. And what do what do they do? The, these waste pickers, what they do is to uh, pick, sort, and sell recyclables and to earn their living. And with the effect of this. This is why we need to, or the treaty needs to include them and talk to them and to acknowledge their, their knowledge in waste management because uh, in the other hand, they also, self, uh, uh, they also serve millions of dollars or cities to the municipals. Work that the municipal are supposed to do is the work that the waste pickers are doing. Like I said, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, for decades that we have been into uh, collecting, sorting, and transportation and sales of recyclables, and 
for this the case is telling us that we have promoted the environment for long and we have saved our planet for long and yet you are not recognized and we are not acknowledged so our voice matters and we West speakers can clearly tell you the emissions that is being saved they have saved there is a data clearly the green gas house emission calculator can tell you the emissions that um the, the waste pickers are saving. And also there are a lot of data showing uh, from IAWP uh, standards, showing the, 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 the vital role that the waste pickers are, are playing uh, in solid waste management and also in the, in the green economy. So it's vital, it's, it's important to, to highlight the role of the waste pickers in the treaty and also not to leave them behind and provide uh, an assist for them in future um, how to um, how to assess a living income so always we we, we said um, a good income how to how to uh, have how to strengthen our organizing capacity and work more and in terms of health and safety, uh, like doctor said, we are we are exposed to all these medical waste, being at the landfill or the street or the downstairs or where areas that we work. There are a lot of chemicals and uh, hazardous waste that we are exposed to. So why not uh, support the waste pickers? Why not include their views? And in fact, waste pickers are the experts in, in, in solid waste management when it comes to waste management because it's, it's, a, it's their profession. That is the work they do for long. It's, it's, it's something that they don't have to uh, go to school, have to go to university. So practically they are on the ground and that is what they do for their lifetime. So they are the experts. And what we are doing is, the, the, is what is promoting the environment and also promoting the, the circular uh, economy. So adequately, we need to be uh, acknowledged. And again, I earlier said that um, without comprehensive data on waste pickers, this can lead to governance responses that are non-inclusive. Simply means there are influences that will come and it will make it will mislead conversations in the treaty and in other areas where waste pickers are supposed to be at the table and highlight and mention their demands. But if we do not pay attention to uh, the data and all these things of waste pickers, along the line, responses will be addressed which are non-inclusive and at the, at the long run, waste pickers will be left out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnson, for speaking so passionately and, and point taken on the exclusion of rights holders and, and especially waste pickers from critical discussions um, that we've had so far. We are running pretty short on time, so I have been asked to move to a final question that, that uh, we want to invite everyone's uh, opinion on is, what's the one thing that you wish to see enshrined in the treaty, and you could reflect it um, through uh, a long-term lens that you want to see in the treaty, or an outcome that you definitely want to see out of the upcoming uh, INC five. Um, let me start by inviting Nirere, and then we we can circle around with other speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that one thing I think um, is, is supposed to be a focus on this solution. These commitments shouldn't be voluntary. We shouldn't see a lot of voluntary action that is being promised. No more promises. We need to see that there is a solutions like zero waste being amplified, being invested into, being recommended as 
policies to government that are going to implement this global plastic treaty. We should see our government come down, work with the people that are recovering this waste, like waste pickers, work with the people in the community, even at household level, at institutional level. We need to see that this works out. I think for the first time, world leaders should be proud that a treaty like this is going to be impactful than any other. So we need to see this come out. So a focus on solutions is that one thing I really want to see being sounding so much than you know the fancy speeches of leaders and all this. So I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nire, and it's a very well made point on legally binding provisions that support real solutions. And just to highlight, uh, in terms of investments made in uh, plastics uh, across its life cycle, only about four percent of investments ever made have gone into reuse and refill, while most of them have gone into recycling, chemical recycling, burning technology, and many other. Uh, problematic uh, issues. With that, I, I want to now invite Andrea for her uh, comments, please. Andrea, we can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me there? Yes. Sir. Okay, good. So in the Just Transition Coalition or Just Transition Working Group, where waste pickers and indigenous peoples and frontline communities are working together to push for a real just transition under the Plastics Treaty, we have uh, very defined um, demands for member states. So first, we would like the member states to retain and strengthen the Just Transition Article with binding measures. We have now a very weak language that is not binding for parties that will uh, rectify the treaty at the moment. Uh, so we need that to be improved. Uh, we would also like to see the mention of just transition in the preamble and, <clears throat> and the link of just transition in, in other articles of the treaty, uh, since this is a subject, uh, it, it is a cross country subject. Uh, and needs to be reflected through the text of the of the treaty. Uh, we also want to see the adoption of the life cycle approach that we are now missing in the non-paper three uh, that is proposed as the base of the debate for INC5. Um, and we need this life cycle approach to provide strong safeguards for human health and the environment. Um, and lastly, we want uh, a treaty to have a dedicated financial mechanism that enables the implementation of just transition and that is accessible for waste pickers, indigenous peoples, and frontline communities. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, can I invite Johnson now? Yes, uh, so simply um, what you want to see in the treaty at the end is a very good um, ethical solution, which is going to benefit people, the indigenous people, and uh, more especially uh, with speakers. And this, um, also I would say we need a, a fair and inclusive just transition in the preamble. And... Uh, um, yeah, like a, a guiding uh, framework which will be equitable for very uh, economic opportunities and social protection for waste pickers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Over to you, uh, Dr. Michelle, although I, I can't preempt your response already. Go ahead. Uh, yes, so. We need to highlight that the purpose of this treaty is to have a legally binding framework that addresses plastic pollution and to protect human health and the environment. 
So we have an opportunity that this plastic treaty can set a legally binding goals and deadline to reduce and detoxify healthcare plastics that will stimulate manufacturers to phase out older, less well-designed products and prioritize development of new ones when there is needed at the health sector. So it will provide a level playing field for everyone for innovation and to help support the existing momentum of change in the health, se health sector. So in healthcare without harm, so our calls to action, for example, for a member state is to advance a health-centered global plastics treaty. So we urge the delegates to commit a just and equitable treaty that respects human rights, limits the production of plastics, eliminate unnecessary plastics, including the single use in the health sector, and prioritizes detoxification. And we call on policymakers and government leaders to demand a treaty that prioritizes health. While for the health sector, so Healthcare Without Harm uh, supports in terms of uh, calling our healthcare professionals and leaders to lead the fight against plastic pollution. So by adopting sustainable practices in their healthcare facilities and um, support the advancing of policy changes to ensure health equities. While for our allies and advocate is to um, inspire community action. So we encourage the public to advocate for policies that prioritizes both the health and the environment and to reduce plastics use and waste in everyday life and to support the health sector uh, that are implementing sustainable practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Michelle. And we have only a few minutes. So in, in case any of you have any questions, comments that you want to add to this discussion, feel free to raise your hand or, or drop a comment. But just reminding us that as we head into INC5, which is scheduled to be the last INC, um, it is absolutely essential that we have binding language on production reduction, chemicals phase out, just transition, uh, and a dedicated financial mechanism um, which supports Global South realities and, and countries and incentivizes them for action and to ensure that this finance uh, prioritize a zero waste hierarchy that is that the, um, the funding is for given first for redesign reduction and then uh, eventually to to re uh, to reuse refill and finally to disposal practices which are considered environmentally safe and just and the cleanup of legacy pollution that many of our global south communities and countries um, are are dealing with right now um, and uh, just to to highlight what uh, Dr. Michelle and the rest of our speakers who've been repeating again and again the equitable treaty, a treaty that brings environmental uh, justice to so many communities who've been impacted. Uh, the treaty must address waste colonialism as well. Currently, if you all know, there's a non-paper from the chair himself, Ambassador Weiss, that uh, does not have a dedicated provision on trade or language on trade or language on transparency and traceability of ca chemicals and has a lot of voluntary uh, language in defining most of the provisions, has no, um, no uh, sort of mention of uh, life cycle of plastics, uh, which is the mandate uh, on which this treaty is based, that the life cycle of plastic begins with extraction and ends with disposal. Um, and we really need to ensure that our country is pushed for that. And uh, there is a lot of unpredictability as we head into INC5. Um, we could still have compilation text as discussion, as, as basis of discussion, or we could have the non-paper, or we could have a mix of both. But what we do know is that there are going to be four contact groups in which discussions will happen. These are informal uh, groups which are not live stream, which are not publicly accessible, um, where different you know, segments and different provisions uh, for the draft treaty uh, will be discussed. And the request from many of our Global South countries is to not do more than two uh, contact groups at a time. So um, we are, we have touched upon so many things and, and we are hopeful. Everything is still on the table and the fight is going to be big and massive. 
um, and the civil society is is well prepared. There is a lot of resources with Gaia, our amazing members, uh, our amazing allies and partners. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to us at any points if you need any kind of policy uh, information or talking points or just you know facts uh, for whether it is global or regional, we have a lot of those resources that are accessible and available and you can visit our website. We will also have a booklet come out um, ahead of INC5, uh, both uh, in print as well as digital copy, which will be made available publicly very, very soon. And the idea is uh, that it would be distributed to our country delegations during INC. This booklet would be available in Spanish and I also believe French in addition to English. Um, and we have tried our best to ensure that all important issues, uh, scenarios are covered in this booklet. Again, I'm dearly thankful to the speakers, to the listeners, to anyone who would listen to this this uh, primer today or, or tomorrow or whenever. Um, and let's join hands, let's support each other, and let's ensure that we have a binding, a legally binding treaty with mandatory controls uh, on uh, plastic production, because without that, we will continue to have the plastic crisis that we are currently in and ensure that voices of uh, the most impacted communities, the waste pickers, indigenous peoples, and solutions uh, are coming from these communities as well as experts like the healthcare professionals who have joined this movement. With that, I will close for tonight, uh, today, th this evening. And uh, thank you again for joining. I'm Arpita and I'm signing out. I will also be at INC5 in case you want to drop in and, and say a quick hello. Thank you so much. Thank you.